Exhibit that's been on the road since 2003. We've traveled the whole length of the Lewis and Clark Trail, and now we're en route back to St. Louis. Today we have a, this is our last program of the day. We have uh, newly printed beautiful schedules for you. You can pick those up at the front desk of our exhibit tent or in the back at the easel board there. That has a, a series of events of today and tomorrow and, and Sunday. And um, so you can plan what kind of programs you want to see and come back to. We have Craig Falcon, who's from the Blackfeet Nation, and he's going to be talking to you about wolf calf and the Lewis and Clark and the Blackfeet. So let's give him a nice round of applause today. And with saying that, I'm going to hand it over to Craig. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hear me back there? All right. My name is Craig Falcon. I am the great grandson, great, great, great grandson of Wolf Calf. Uh, at the time when uh, <clears throat> it's kind of hard for me to talk about this because it is a sensitive subject due to the fact that uh, you know we we got we got into it with Lewis and Clark, and <laughs> so some of the things I may say might be a little bit um, hard because of uh, things that happened to our people since Lewis and Clark came, came about through our country. Um, but just bear with me, I'll do the best I can. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dick back there for helping me out, getting things set up, getting me, getting me arranged here and helping me with my travel plans and my, um, my stay here. I'd also like to thank my fiance here. <laughs> I know she didn't want me to say anything, but we're going to get married next year at the Sundance. I, I told her when I introduced her to do a twirl, but she, there ain't a spotlight here, so I can't put it on her. But anyhow, uh, this story was told to me by my grandfather, George Nightgun, around 1976 while we were uh, in the in an area that is the original battle site. And the reason I say original battle site is because um, in, in our tradition, in our stories that were handed down to, to our people, uh, the battle site yeah, with Lewis and Clark is in a totally different area. It's, it's probably uh, five miles south of where it's documented today. And I, I find that somewhat funny because uh, I drive, I've been driving by there all my life and it always reminds me of me and my grandfather when we were out, uh, we were getting teepee pegs. And he started talking about, uh, he wasn't talking about Lewis and Clark at first, he was talking about uh, a horse medicine bundle that his father had that is now in the Smithsonian. Now, he was telling me the origin of that horse medicine bundle uh, and how it came about. And where that horse medicine bundle originated was from Wolf Calf himself. There's a book that's Smithsonian printed. Um, it's called The Blackfoot and the Horse Culture. And in that book, you'll see detailed information about the, the, the dreams and the visions that he had that brought that bundle about and how it was transferred down from family member to family member until its, until its present time. In 19... 50, when um, my great grandfather passed away, Wallace Nightgun, uh, he passed away in 1950, that horse bundle somehow disappeared. And for years we searched for that bundle and it ended up in the Smithsonian Institute. So we're working on getting that back, in, back to our tribe and to our family. That's a very big, big part of our, our uh, spirituality back home. It's a very powerful bundle. It's powerful like the Thunder Bundle, the Beaver Bundle. If any of you are familiar with those types of uh, uh, spiritual things in each, each tribe. They are um, somewhat, they're, con they're all connected to the Sundance. The Sundance is a renewal ceremony that we have each year in, a, in the summertime, June through August. We just finished the Sundance up in uh, Brockett, Alberta. Uh, which was our last one of the year. There's different societies that that come to these sun dances, and what it is is the four-day sacrifice to renew 
Mother Earth. Renew um, the two leggings, the four leggings, the winged and the hoofed and the fur barriers and all the other beings, all the good holy beings that, are, that walk this earth. That's just a... But the reason this is so hard for me to talk about is because when you look at our land mass, this is what it used to be. Our, our four bands of the Blackfeet stretched out all the way up into Canada, Saskatchewan, um, down to the Yellowstone and almost down to I uh, southern Idaho. But as time progressed, uh, treaties shortened our, our home base and shortened to the point where this is our home base now. Up north is our relatives in, in Brockett, Standoff, Gleeson, um, Siksika that are in Canada. There's one band of Blackfeet is in, in the United States and three in, the, in, in Canada. Well, I guess I'll tell you the story now. It's, re it's really hard for me because of all the different things that happen to our people. And my grandfather's a really good educator, a good teacher about teaching us the changing of our world into today's world. And I was very fortunate to have such an educated elder constantly taking me to ceremony, constantly taking me out and teaching me things about our people. Well, anyhow, when we were down, it's called a river called Birch Creek, where the original, uh, the true battle site is. We talked about the bundle and we talked about the different um, rules and things like that of acquiring that bundle. But when we talked, when he talked about, after we talked about that bundle, he told me a, a story about Wolf Calf and when Wolf Calf was a young boy. He said he was with eight other boys that were ages 13 to 15. They're horse herders, making sure the horses were all staying close to camp and things like that. These boys one day were riding and they came, up, came upon these, they called them trappers during those days because we always had a lot of French fur trappers coming down, things like that, Hudson Bay Company. And uh, when they ran into these trappers, let me back up a second. One of the most important things during this time, see this isn't documented in our history very well because it wasn't a significant part of our history. These are just like any other people passing through. We didn't know that 200 years later we'd be standing here knowing that Lewis and Clark became famous and uh, routed a passage to the, to the west side. So it wasn't something that was documented really good in our history. But as the story goes, and the journal also relates to this in, some, in, in a way, they camped with Lewis and Clark that night that morning, like any young men of that, that era, 13 to 15 year olds, first thing on their mind is, okay, let's case out what these guys have. They got guns, they got horses. If we can acquire these guns and horses, then it's going to give us great honor and respect, and maybe we'll be invited out to do more things with the older men, like war parties, horse raids, things like that. So they camped that night. Lewis and, Lewis and Clark shared their tobacco, shared some gifts, exchanged stories and whatnot, and communicated about, you know, different aspects of our country and how they can get through our country. Early that morning around, I'd say, three or four, um, just like the journal states, uh, these young boys started to take the horses, take the guns from uh, Lewis and his group, and started to make off with them. But as young boys, you know, they're not experienced at, at these things of, of war or stealing. So as soon as uh, Lewis and them woke up, it was just a giant skirmish. And you can imagine any, anybody that has a 13 to 15 year old, when they know that they're in trouble or they know they got caught at something, they're all going to scatter. And so they scattered in all different directions. Um, my great-great-great-grandfather scattered with horses. Uh, 
others scattered in different directions. Some were right still in camp, uh, engaging in with some hand-to-hand -hand with uh, Lewis and his group. But uh, things turned ugly after that. Um, in our interpretation of this story, uh, one of the young men was stabbed in the back while trying to flee, and the other was on horseback, and he was shot in the back, riding away, but lived, lived for a while until he got back to camp. Um, after that, the other boys got back to camp and they started to tell the men what happened, but by the time they reached the battle site, Lewis and his group had already gone. Now, history and the journals, you know, they, they say a lot of things about it was a, a war party of Blackfeet. Um, that's, that's really hard for me to believe. And then when I go by the, the historic signs along the highway, I was just recently there at the, the other battle site that's documented by the state, and it shows um, a young man in a skirmish, and he's getting stabbed. But it's not a young man. It's a very muscular warrior. And that's one thing that's really disturbing to me is because they always portray that um, the Lewis fought a, a war party. Now, you've got to think about this realistically. If it was a war party of Blackfeet, eight against four, we are very well known for our battle skills, and um, I don't think Lewis's party would have even survived if there was really a, a war party. These are young children, 13 to 18. If I had my son here, he's, he's a 6'1", 13-year-old. You can see that it's just a skinny, skinny kid. And those of you that have teenagers know what I mean. When you're dealing with uh, teenagers, they're, they're not grown warriors. They're not grown men. So I, I, I love my country to death, but you know, sometimes the history of how the United States and our, and our people interacted is, just isn't written right. And some, uh, in the last presentation, I heard people talking about um, we don't want to rewrite history, but I feel strongly that history was rewritten when they wrote those journals because they didn't write it correctly. And to further prove that fact, you've got to look at it this way. Not only was there eight against four, but after that happened, Lewis and his group of men rode the entire day and night to get out of that country. Now they apparently knew that they did something very wrong. That, uh, that they did, I don't want to say the, use harsh words like murder, but you know, that, that's realistic. That's, that's the realistic word for it. Um, but they had no choice. These boys were definitely going to steal their weapons and steal their horses. For, to, to gain honor in our tribe. After, after that, you know, this is, this is really tough for me to talk about because this, um, this Lewis and Clark journey really was the beginning of the end for our people. And I'm talking about all Northern Plains tribes. You know, if, if, It, all, it dates all the way back to the, uh, the purchase of the Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase, okay? I don't think Lewis and Clark came to tribes and said, you know, you know, we come to check out the land that we bought, even though it was our land. You know, I think if they would have did that, I think they would have been, they would have had more skirmishes with more tribes. But uh, they came through as explorers, and the tribes accepted them as explorers, and... Uh, greeted them that way. Some of the things that uh, my grandfather my grandfather told me was that our people were always a warlike people, very strong, very spiritual. And this rattle here is a crazy dog rattle, crazy dog society. These are the like the Marine Corps of our tribe. These are the, the ones that are always up front for
for battle. I am also a Crazy Dog Society member and also a Horn Society member. Um, both are very spiritual societies today. But in the same sense, we still guard our people in a, in a, in a traditional way. Like we have our traditional court now that all the crazy dogs sit as, a, as the judge and jury of that court. And it's not a court of losing or winning. It's a court of mediation where you work out your problems and things like that. Um, this is my grandfather and my grandmother. And one of the things I always like to show is these are the holy teepees that we had. These three here belong to Wolf Calf and his medicine, his horse medicine bundle. You'll see the elk teepee, creator's teepee, and the other one in the back is the otter teepee. And the reason I like to show this picture a lot is because it all shows my mother when she was a child. She always, she's always embarrassed about that. But that was pretty much the story that was handed down from my grandfather to me and to my brothers and sisters. Um, it, it's not a very uh, glamorous story because the his history is written differently. But I thank the Dick and his people for allowing me to come up here and tell the truth about what really happened. And this ne the next two years, we have our, our cultural team. We're going to be um, surveying the original site and marking that as the original battle site. Is there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Hang on one second, and I'll bring the microphone over to you, Bobby. After the uh, boys died, uh, one died immediately and one died later, um, were they laid to rest at that site, and, or they, were they taken home? Because like our people, they used to bury them right where they fell. No, they were taken home for a proper burial. Greg, when we saw you last month, you spoke about who really was stealing what after that event. Um, and Lewis, I believe in his journal, listed some things he, he took with him when he skedaddled out of there. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, yes. Um, as you'll see in Lewis's journal, he, they talked about the condition of their horses. Their horses were pretty much ran down. They, they, were, they were lame. And I think the the whole uh, raid by these, by these teenagers really went awry because Lewis turned out, he came out with better horses. The horses that these young boys had were very healthy and very fast and they had a lot of endurance. And those are the horses that they used to get away that night, that day and night. So if they would have used their own horses, they probably wouldn't have got as far and they may, they may have gotten, gotten caught. And, and, you know, this brings me to another I, uh, thing I just thought about was, in the journal it also states that uh, Lewis's party came in there and it was, it was raining every day. It was raining every day and they couldn't use their equipment properly to find out where they were. They didn't have a GPS satellite tracking system like we do today. So that, that's why that spot is marked where it is today. And it's, it's, it's close, but five miles is quite a distance. We have a lot of rivers that run through that area and meet. And they, they just happen to be a little bit off when, they, when the Boy Scouts uh, surveyed it 40 years ago. Indian name before Blackfeet? What kind of? Everybody knows how you got your name Blackfeet. We're the South Pagan. And there are stories about how we got the name Blackfeet. And uh, it, it's a pretty good story. Um, when we used to do raids on other tribes, our, and most tribes were 
far away like the crows and uh, the cinnaboins and uh, the flatheads. We didn't want to always be looking over our shoulders coming back. So we'd get so far away from their camps and we'd start huge grass fires, our forest fires. So our, our moccasins were always black all the time from, you know, coming back from battle so we can come back in a slow, peaceful way, heal up from our wounds, check out our new prizes of horses and women and things like that. And um, that's how we got the name Blackfeet. My, um, my name, Falcon, that's my father's name. He, his last name is uh, Ron Falcon. He's a Grovant. My mother's a Blackfeet. She's a night gun. My Indian name is Sabina Maka, named after my great-grandfather, Wallace Nightgun, who was a, was a holy man. Uh, the traditional name for our Indian people is Amskapi Pakani, uh, real people. Yes? Let me come around with the microphone so you can be heard by everybody. Did you have, at that time, warrior societies, and were these boys too young to be in a warrior society or not yet uh, qualified? Yeah, they, they were too young. They were part of the Dove Society. The Dove Society, um, or the Chickadee Society, is for, is for young boys, uh, uh, young girls growing up. And then they advance into these larger societies. Uh, say, for instance, the Crazy Dog Society. Back then, you'd, you'd gain that uh, entry into the society by going into war, going into horse raids, things of bravery. Uh, nowadays, we induct members into the Crazy Dog Society based on um, their service in the armed forces, Marines, Air Force, Navy, um, Army, things like that. You mentioned that Lewis and his party rode all day and all night back to the Missouri and that, and that some Blackfeet went back to the skirmish site. In the Blackfeet oral history, does it say that they also pursued the party past the skirmish site back to the Missouri River? In other words, did, they, did, did you folks, ancestors, pursue Lewis like he thought you were doing? They, were, they pursued, but due to the heavy, heavy rain, I mean, it was raining for days before he arrived there and all the way after. So tracking them was very hard. And the ground that they're running on is, you know, like the clay, it's really hard. They followed them probably a good 20 or 30 miles and then, uh, well, thought they were following them. They were probably making circles and looking for sign, things like that, but they couldn't pick it up. The Blackfeet are, in those days were nomadic tribes, right? To that area, or did you have permanent uh, campgrounds? Well, I'll show you one of our, our main areas that we like the most. We followed the buffalo like most Plains tribes. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Today we're located here, but our central area was usually right around in here, up in the Canada. <laughs> there we go. This was our main area. This was our main area due to food supply. This area was rich in buffalo, elk, deer, you name it. Um, the Rocky Mountains, uh, they didn't have too, too, much, uh, too much game in there when it came to buffalo. And when you have a tribe of 30,000 30, plus, you know, you're going to need a lot of buffalo to feed that many people. So th that was our main area. 
these areas that bordered us, we protected them as, as our traditional hunting grounds. Um, if any of you know Blackfeet history, we were probably one of the most uh, notorious and hated tribes in our area because uh, we kept people out. And we were very, uh, very vicious when we did, we did keep people out. And uh, we, we loved to fight. We loved to travel and we loved to fight and take over other people's possessions like horses and, and women. How many Blackfeet are there today? Well, due to smallpox, uh, we got cut down from 30,000 down to 6,000 in just about a four or five year period. Today, we're at 14,000. And we still have the four major bands. They live, did they live in teepees all winter up there? Yes. Made out of buffalo hide. Yeah, the wind is, is somewhat really strong up there, so I imagine a buffalo hide teepee had to be pegged down pretty good. Were the fur, uh, was the fur on the buffalo left on your, your winter encampment uh, teepee hide structures, or was it also taken off? No, it was, it was taken off. It was tanned. You said there was 30,000. Were you all together, or were they spread out over that entire area in different places? We were spread out over this entire area. Um, like I said, we followed the buffalo, and we watched our borders. But every year when we'd have ceremonies, like the Sundance, that's like our most important ceremony of the year, we would all come together. Can you elaborate on the Sundance ceremony as it's done today? Uh, I'm not supposed to, but I can, I can talk about it a little bit. Like I said, it's a four-day ceremony. Uh, most men that go in there, say if I went in there today and I had sick family or, um, or, or something I needed to uh, fix in myself mentally, I'd go into Sundance and and vow that I, I need this help, and Creator would um, see my sacrifice and help me fix that. And there's, in the Sundance, you'll find a lot of spiritual leaders, a lot of these bundles that I talked about, where there'll be healing ceremonies throughout the Sundance. Healing ceremonies fixing, fixing anything and everything. The horse medicine bundle that I talked about earlier was one of the most powerful and feared bundles of our tribe, and it's still feared today because a lot of our spiritual people say that that bundle itself is so powerful that our spiritual leaders today do not want to, to deal with it because, uh, because of its power. Um, my mother and my aunts have witnessed the last opening of that bundle in 1949. And, you know, they've witnessed some really spectacular healings, one of which uh, was a man that was that was shot in the side and he spent uh, three nights at the ceremony at the horse dance ceremony and he walked out of there without even a scar so that tells you the the power of that bundle now you know better you talked about the Blackfeet protecting their borders and their boundaries so <laughs> Uh, well, f fearlessly. Right now, the American-Canadian border runs right through your, your territory. How do you as a people, work, how do you work with that? You know, how do you keep relationships going? What kind of interaction is there between the different groups now? Good question. Well, the way we interact with the uh, United States and the Canadian government, it's, it's a heated issue right now because we have a lot of spiritual things and... Uh, that we want to pass through that border without being um, dissected, so to say. Because a lot of our, anytime we go to Canada, we'll, we're carrying eagle feathers or bundles. Uh, those things are not supposed to be opened by, unless you have the rights to open them. And when I mean rights, 
When you, when you receive anything that is spiritual or holy, it isn't like you go to the store and buy it. It's something that you earned over years and years of teaching. Like, for instance, some men can have a, have a holy pipe, and they could get that pipe at their first vision quest, you know, their first fasting. But then there's some men that pray just as hard and live a good life. They might go a whole entire lifetime before they get a pipe. incident with Lewis and Clark, I understand it happened on the way over to the ocean. And back. Oh, on the way back. Okay. Question in the back over here. Uh, is it true that the Blackfeet were never defeated by the U.S. government? Yes, that's, that's very true in one sense. We were never defeated in battle, but how we were defeated was with smallpox. That was, uh, that was our Holocaust. Germ warfare wiped us completely out. And after that, that's when um, our land base, our land base, started to shrink and it shrunk and it shrunk until we're at our, our present location which lies on the eastern front of the Rockies and the southern portion of Canadian border which is about I think it's 2.5 million acres what percent of that is of the original? what percent of that? <laughs> I'd say that's about three or four percent of the original. Um, there's a lot of traditional sites that you'll see that are being documented throughout Montana now where you'll see uh, like Valley of the Shields. If any of you have heard of Valley of the Shields, uh, a lot of Blackfeet artifacts were found there. A lot of Blackfeet uh, remains were found there as a burial site. And that's all the way down along the Yellowstone River. Um, buffalo jumps throughout Montana date back to, to Blackfeet through artifacts being found, things like that. Are there any other questions for Craig? These are all good questions, by the way. You said that, uh, that the horse bundle is in the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, what do you feel the chances of, of your people getting it back someday? Very, very strongly. I've been working on uh, repatriating that bundle probably for the last 12 years. Um, I probably would have received it by now, but uh, I don't feel that I have the rights or the, the knowledge to handle something that sacred. So until I learn everything I need to learn about that, um, it'll have to stay there. Will you be the keeper of that bundle if, when it comes back? Yes. Did the Blackfeet tribe have weapons in that time, uh, repeating rifles or single shot rifles, or did they prefer bows and arrows? And could you compare the effectiveness of uh, a Blackfoot shooting a bow and arrow to uh, U.S. cavalrymen shooting a single shot rifle? Uh, the comparison is <laughs> they, they did just have bows and arrows, muskets. Matter of fact, one of the things that I'm I'm trying to track down my grandfather, George Nightgun, um, had this musket hanging on the wall for years, and I wanted to get a hold of that so we can carbon date it, find out when, when he, when, where that, that musket came from, because my, um, my mother and my aunts believed that it came from this skirmish. And he gave that, 
he gave that to his friend Peter Redhorn, and Peter Redhorn and my grandfather have since passed, but I'm trying to get a hold of his family to find out exactly what happened to that rifle. And the comparison, I guess that depends on, you know, the person that's fighting, you know. If, if, if you're a good warrior, I think you can out, you can out maneuver somebody with a single shot repeat, uh, single shot rifle. You know, if, yeah, I only have one shot. And they, they could shoot a bow like you're shooting a repeating rifle. And the bows were 70 to 80 pounds in, in, you know, if any of you are bow hunters, a 70 to 80 pound pull is, is pretty good. Good question, right there in the front row. Right. Does your tradition talk about the does your tra tradition talk about the kidnapping of Sacagawea and what happened to her after that? No, <laughs> no, we don't. We we were just talking about that on the way here, and I just had to laugh. I said, "Well, if they would have brought Sacagawea in our country, and if there was a war party that ran into Lewis and his group." Lewis and them would have all been dead at Birch Creek and Sacagawea would have been married into our tribe and she would have had some Blackfeet descendants. <laughs> is, is there any story that talks about the, um, the start of the bad feelings between the Crow and the Blackfeet? <laughs> You know, I don't know if I want to talk about that because my fiance, she's crow. <laughs> I might be sleeping out in the van tonight, you know. <laughs> I I think it was more of a territorial issue. Um, if you look at if you look at these maps, our territory runs down to the Yellowstone. Okay, that was part of our traditional hunting area. So I imagine any time we were down in that area and they were up in that area, we were at each other's throats, along with the flatheads on this side, the Cinnaboy and Sioux on that side, and the Crees coming from the top. I mean, there's a lot of documented history of all the battles that we had with different tribes surrounding us. So what started the battles is probably because we stole all their women and all their horses <laughs> At least they're best looking women and their best horses. Good, and when, good I'm gonna, recovery, and good when good I recovery. tell the story of how I met her, I stole her. She didn't steal me. <laughs> I captured her. And, that, and you know, one, one of the things that is most important, and I see coming more about and more about. When I was a, a, a young boy, tradition, spirituality, and things like that were really hidden because you'd get scrutinized for it. Um, my grandfather used to tell me stories of when the missionaries first came and um, how, he was, how his hair was cut, how he was beaten for speaking his language because he didn't know English language. And it took him three tries to run away from a missionary school and finally get into Canada. The first time he made it as far as the Milk River and he was caught, brought back to the barn, beat it. The second time he was caught not very far, taken back, beaten. And then the third time he stole a horse and he rode all the way into Canada and stayed there. And you know, it, it really affected him in, in such a way that he did not allow my mother or my uncles to attend school. My mother attended school up until the sixth grade. That's how, that's how much emotional damage that, that caused on him that he didn't want his kids to get uh, abused like that. Did, did I miss it? Uh, could you speak a little bit more about your life today, what you're doing with the tribe, you know, with your people and, and so on? I'm presently the court administrator for our Blackfeet Tribal Court. I administer a, a small court uh, staff of about 25. Um, we handle criminal and civil law and traditional law. 
Um, other than that, I've always been a um, Marine Corps vet. I'm also a, a traditionalist. I was born and raised by my grandfather. Um, one of the things that's most important is my grandfather took the time, no matter where we lived. See, me and my, my siblings, we're all part of the Relocation Act. So we were born throughout different parts of the country. I was born in Redwood City, California because, you know, my parents had to move and they were trying to retrain them to be modern citizens. But my grandparents would take the time and travel wherever we were and grab my, myself and my oldest brother and bring us all summer to ceremony. Until we moved back to Montana in the early 70s and then it, was, it just became a daily part of life. I live in East Glacier, well, not East Glacier, Montana. I live north of Browning, about uh, four miles. Uh, one of the things that we still hold in our family is um, our, 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 our family home base, where as you see my pictures of my great-grandfather. We still live uh, where he was buried, where he, where he was born, where my grandfather was born. We still hold that land. We still take care of that land. We still have ceremonies at that land. My name is Craig Falcon. Yes. My uh, mother is Velma Nightgun. My grandfather is George Nightgun and Clara Nightgun. That's on my Blackfeet side, and on my uh, Fort Belknap side, my dad is Ron Falcon Sr. <laughs> okay, cousin. <laughs> so you're buying dinner, cousin? <laughs> Since I'm a visitor? <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah? Are you going to have guts? <laughs> That's one of our uh, traditional meals is tripe. I love tripe. Tripe, berry soup. Uh, have it, have any, has anybody ever tried blood soup? You tried blood soup? Fresh from the kill? Geez, that's good. Does anybody know why we, we have blood soup? We, we take that part of the animal after a kill and that animal, animal becomes a part of us. I have a funny story about... Uh, Hunting. I'm always hunting. I took these two therapists with me hunting. I used to work in a mental health center. And they were so anxious to hunt. They said, we want to hunt, hunt with you, you know, your way, the traditional way. And I said, okay, well, went and went to the um, purification ceremony, the sweat lodge, and sweat, the, sweat all day. And the next day, you know, we got up and we smudged and smudged our rifles and prayed and said, I told them, you know, you guys got to, you got to always have good thoughts. You never can think bad when you're doing things like this. So right off the bat, I shot a buck, nice little buck. Cut him open and took the kidney out. And I said, it's, it's traditional that, you know, either drink some blood or you eat part of this kidney. So I cut it in three pieces. Sat there and popped a nice big piece in my mouth and blood was kind of dripping down. <laughs> really chewing like a big piece of bubble gum and acted like I swallowed it and I said okay you guys go ahead I had it in the back of my mouth <laughs> anyhow they started chewing and she I could just see her face turning green <laughs> pretty soon she was kind of wobbling and she closed her eyes and she swallowed it and her husband he was he was he must have had a tougher stomach he chewed it up and swallowed it as soon as I got done swallowing I spit mine out <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I drank some blood soup, though, but I just had to do that to him to pull a joke on him. <laughs> but I really feel bad about it because the entire day, she threw up. The entire day. Each time we tried to go to a next draw to hunt, she was leaning over, throwing up. Finally, we had to bring the truck to her and load her up and bring her home. And she just, she just couldn't handle the traditional way. <laughs> <laughs> but she did a good job. Straight blood, straight out of the animal when it's nice and hot. Well, let's thank Craig Falcon for coming in today. Give him a nice round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. It's a pleasure having you in the Ten of Many Voices. That ends our schedule for today, folks, but there's a lot of stuff still going on site and down near the fair, um, powwow ground and the teepee village. If you haven't uh, picked up a schedule yet, we have new, brand new, colorful schedules in the back of the easel board there or at the front of our exhibit tent. Please take one, and we'll see you here tomorrow morning. Thank you.